going to briefly introduce Dr. Al Ansari. Uh, Dr. Ansari is a, a professor of intensive care medicine in Ain Shams University. It's our pleasure to introduce him today as the second speaker for uh, this evening. I'm not going to uh, go on and on about the extensive expertise of Dr. Al Ansari, but I will leave him to start his presentation and it is about modalities of continuous renal replacement therapy. Please start, Dr. Ansari. Thank you. Uh, good evening. Thank you, Dr. Ramona. Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome for our attendees. Good luck, inshallah, for you. I am going to speak about one of the methods for renal replacement therapy. Uh, renal replacement therapy, of course, indicated in certain patients who exhibit some complications as over, over uh, volumia, hyperkalemia, severe acidosis. Uh, in such situations, we have to think uh, renal failure to subject the patient to renal replacement therapy. One of the commonest routes of renal replacement therapy is hemodialysis, as all of us know. But in certain patients and in certain situations, we can follow the hemodialysis technique, especially in patients exhibiting hemodynamic alterations or severely hypotensive. And so there, are, uh, there is the continuous renal replacement therapy, which is a blood flow is not so uh, rapid. It is a slow method of dialysis. It is a slow method of hemofiltration. And actually, it is more and more indicated in patients associated with too much pro-inflammatory cytokines, such as cyto cytokine storm, so we're suffering now in COVID-19. Uh, and so on, and severe sepsis, acute heart failure, and, and extensive birth is indicated in such situations. Really. And so what is a continuous renal replacement therapy? It is an extracorporeal blood purification therapy over an extended period of time. Uh, 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 the requirement for CRT, we need a double lumen venous or venous -venu, Hemolysis castor, large bore castor inserted in one of the big veins, like internal jugular or uh, femoral vein, subclavian, but most commonly we insert in the femoral or internal jugular. An extracorporeal circuit and a hemofilter, and also a blood pump and an effluent pump to withdraw blood from the patient and the washing the blood back to the patient, and then effluent pump to withdraw blood from, uh, withdraw the ultrafiltration from the therapy. With a specific CRT therapy, dialysis or replacement pump are required as we will see now. Really, I am going to give you the important points related to CRT. Not CRT in detail, but some points which is more important and you have to remember in using CRT. How, what is a CRT? how we can run the CRT, uh, these are questions we have to answer. This is a vascular axis, as you know, as you see, double lumen castor inserted in the venous site and withdraw blood through the reddish uh, one, reddish uh, port, and the returning blood goes through the blue one. Uh, its, uh, its length, of course, depends on which vein you will insert your castor. If internal jugular, it will be right, internal jugular will be 15 centimeter. If it is in the subclavian, it will also be, if it is in the left, internal jugular will be 20 centimeter. The femoral one will be more denser, about 25 centimeters. Uh, the filtration uh, in CRT will depend on many mechanisms for ultrafiltration or for getting rid out of the uh, waste products or waste molecules like urea, potassium, and, and especially the high molecular sites, which is the cytokines. In inflammatory cytokines, of course, you need a big bore filter like this. This is a filter. This is a filter, and the blood is running in this direction. Blood running in the dialysate, also directed in the opposite direction to increase the efficacy of filtration. And the diffusion or getting rid out and the mechanism of the getting rid of these uh, molecules or solutes, unwanted solutes like urea and potassium and, and 
get through several mechanisms. The most popular, which we, we know, the diffusion, according to the concentration gradient, which we see in hemodialysis. But here in hemofiltration, we depend on other mechanisms in addition to diffusion. We depend on absorption and we depend on convection, which is pressure gradient in between blood compartment and the uh, uh, dialysis compartment. Mechanism of solute removal, diffusion, absorption, convection, and the solvent drain. Solvent drain while the solvent or dialysis or the replacement flow passing through, this force, it will withdraw with that the molecule, unwasted molecule, and the pro inflammatory cytokines. Uh, in such, uh, we see here the filter, and we have different types of filters, of course, as I said, uh, uh, differ in its pore size, differ in its uh, uh, membrane material, maybe synthetic, maybe cellulose. The most efficient or we use is the synthetic one. And I see, as we see here, as I said, the direction of blood in this direction and is that dialysis or replacement of blood in the other, di uh, other direction to increase the efficacy of convection. I am, I am going now to summarize to you the modalities of CRT. We hear about many modalities like SCAF or slow continuous ultrafiltration. We hear about the hemodial continuous hemodialysis, hemofiltration, continuous hemodialysis, uh, uh, continuous hemodialysis, hemofiltration. And so we, are, we have four types. The first one, which is a scuff slow continuous ultrafiltration, uh, this means we use it in patient exempting the hypervolemia, really. not uh, uremic uh, to high degree, but hypervolemic, and we want to. Uh, get rid of the extra fluid, and this is an old one we use it before since many years. This is a filter here, and the blood access blood coming here. The blood flow from about uh, 80 to 200 according to blood pressure observation, and this is the ultrafiltrate about 20 to 200 mL per hour, and the ultrafiltrate. No, in, in this uh, in this type or in this uh, modality, we're not using uh, either dialysis uh, or replacement. And so it is primary indication here is a fluid overload without uremia. The main mechanism of water transport, ultrafiltration, ultrafiltration. And it used specifically for patients exerting hypotension, and we have no CRT machine, and so we use this simple one, which is a stuff or so. We can use it over 12 hours, 20 hours, and so the other uh, mode is uh, continue hemovenous hemofiltration. In hemofiltration, as I said, we depend on two mechanisms. In addition to diffusion, we depend on absorption of getting rid out of molecules and also on convection, which is a pressure gradient or solvent gradient. And so this is con continuous hemovenous hemofiltration. hemofiltration. And if we look, this is a simple simplified uh, diagram. This is a filter, blood coming from the patient in the rate of 80 to 20 uh, to 200 mL per minute. And the throw a pump here, pushing the blood through the filter, pushing the blood through the filter, and is then going out to return and returning to the patient. At the same time, we use a replacement flow. Replacement flow, which is a physiological. Uh, so, uh, nearly composition of physiological sign with add some uh, ions like magnesium, potassium, and so on, and some uh, buffers like bicarbonate, and this is uh, that replacement. Replacement fluid, we can push it, through, we push it through pump also, either, uh, either uh, pre filter or post filter. If we push it pre filter, it will help in the convection efficacy, so it will increase the uh, ultra help in getting rid out of more nucleus and decreases the coagulability of the filter. The ultrafiltrate coming out according to pressure gradient is created by a fluid pump here also and the ultrafiltration about 20 to 100 mm. The fluid coming here, the flowing fluid is uh, related to the fluid taken from the patient in addition to the replacement. But if I insert the replacement flow post-filter, I think there is some sort of 
uh, replacement flow going to the patient. And so in such situations, we have to uh, make flow chart for the patient. Flow chart every eight hours, every 12 hours, according, in my opinion, according to the nursing hours, hours, we have to calculate the intake and the output. The the continuous venous venous infiltration is very efficient really in removing bro, uh, inf uh, removal of bro inflammatory mediators like cytokines. And because I say, as I said, it works with convection, more with convection, more with pressure gradient between the blood and compartment of the blood and the compartment in which is coming the ultra filtration. The other method or modality of the CRT machine, or the other mode, is the continuum venous venous hemodialysis. Continuum venous venous hemo, uh, uh, hemodiafiltration. This is continuum venous venous hemodialysis. In hemodialysis, we use the dialysis, but no replacement. Always in hemofiltration, we use replacement flow and dialysis, but in hemo, Dialysis, we use only dialysis like here. Here we use dialysis, coming, blood coming from the patient with the same rate, according to his blood pressure, to the filter, and this is returning to the patient again. And this is the dialysis in the opposite point of the filter. If the excess of blood from up, we have to insert the dialysis down here. And so the blood in one compartment, separated by semipermeable mem membranes from the dialysis. And this is a fluid, a fluid, fluid or ultra filtration helped by pump. This pump also help in creating some negative pressures and so creating some uh, uh, increasing the gradient for the more filtration or more solute dragging through the convection. Uh, and a fluid removed then from the patient plus there is this amount of fluid coming here equals the fluid removed from blood from the patient in addition to the dialysis which we use. The other mode or the fourth mode or the last one is the continuous venous venous hemodialysis filtration. Continue venous venous hemodialysis filtration. In this, we, we, we can see here dialysis and filtration. And so we use replacement flow and dialysis. As I said, dialysis always used in dialysis. Replacement fluid used in hemofiltration, in hemofiltration. And the replacement fluid, as you see, it is going to the blood compartment, enters the blood compartment of the filter. But dialysis enters the other compartment or, or the counter current uh, compartment of the filter. And so this method is the most popular. We have continued venous, venous hemodialysis filtration. We're using it in many patients, like especially septic patients, severe sepsis. Patient with cytokine, cytokine storm, a patient with uh, severe extensive death, patient with heart failure, really give good results for getting rid out of pro inflammatory molecules. As we know, pro inflammatory molecules is larger than the potassium and the urea and the magnesium atoms. So it needs some sort of pressure gradient in this cell to getting rid out of this uh, waste products. And so we have four models. This cuff, as I said, the continuum venous venous hemodialysis, the continuum venous venous hemofiltration, and the continuum venous venous hemodialysis filtration. These are the four modalities of hemofiltration or CRT, which are used inside any, any CRT machine. Uh, the benefit of CRT machine also, we don't forget, it can give me, we can use that in patient with uh, uh, fever, high fever to Increase temperature as I said, or increasing the temperature also warming the patient. Uh, dose of CRT as any drug, as any drug, as vasopressors, antibiotics, and so on. And the, it's, uh, the uh, depend on the uh, how its markers is efficiency, intensity, frequency, and the chemical efficacy. This used for CRT evaluation or dose of CRT. Efficiency gives you an idea what, what is the volume of blood, how many ml cleared from waste products like urea in uh, 24 hours, in 12 hours. Intensity is meaning the effic efficiency multiplied by the intensity, multiplied by the, by the time. This is the intensity of removal. 
And the frequency over, we can use it every week. We can use it every, uh, over a long period of time. Sometimes you are using it for one week uh, for uh, some patients. And also the clinical uh, efficacy of this uh, mood, uh, these are re uh, regarded how to represent the dose of the CRT. Anticoagulation and, and CRT. In, and of course, we, we are afraid from clotting of this fact. And so, and even if it is clotted and you have to change it, it is expensive at uh, uh, one point. And the other point, uh, you, you will lose some blood during the change of this filter. You will lose about at least 300 men of blood, even with flushing and so on. And so we have to anticoagulate for this filter to avoid clotting of the blood. We can use it either, either uh, small dose of unfractionated heparin, like five units uh, per kg per hour, uh, and there is a special syringe you can uh, put in at this analyzed uh, solution. Also, the priming solutions which we use to flushing these tubes, we can hyperanalyze that, so cutting about uh, 10,000 units and uh, 500 cc for flushing. Also, we can use regional anticoagulation to this filter. We can give heparin here, and we give glutamine post filter. We give heparin re filter and antagonize the dose here by giving glutamine. If the patient is exhibiting some sort of coagulacy, or some sort of bleeding problems and so And so we have to antagonize our dose. Other uh, points, suppose your patients have a uh, problem with heparin. He has head, for example. Uh, we can use ergotropin, we can use prostacyclin, we can use other anticoagulants. We can use citrate, but we can give citrate here pre-filter, and we have to give calcium here post-filter because as you know, citrate, we are slow decreasing the ionized calcium and so to less than 0.35. And so we have to give calcium post filter. And so many methods for anticoagulation of this. You can give anticoagulant systematic if your patients not tolerating disease regional one. We can give, especially if your patient suffering from other problem like DVT and he at the same time needs systemic anticoagulation. Suppose your patient is uh, suffering from coagulopathy and INR is high, more than two, or platelets more than 50,000, no need to use anticoagulant in such situations. Uh, this is a summary, really, for uh, about nutrition in the CRT. CRT is indicated in malnourished patients, in patients uh, exacting malnutrition, and in patients with renal failure, and we can't supplement them with feeding. We can't push wash feeding and such patients. And the patient in CRT, you can, we have to give high protein dose, about 1.5 to 2 gram, 2.5 gram per kg at least per day. We have to give more calories, about uh, sometimes we give 40 calories per kg per day because this patient is in severe catabolism. CRT working as uh, shifting the patient from renal failure patients to such maybe normal patients because the CRT working if it is efficient in its work. And so you have to push your feeding, you have to nourish your patient. And so it is indicated and sometimes in malnourished patient and in extensive care. Uh, about uh, also in nutrition, we don't forget to supplement the patient with vitamins and the trace elements, especially vitamin C, vitamin K in some patients, vitamin D, uh, by vitamin B6. He need and some trace elements like cover and so on. Drug dosing in CRT, and this I think uh, problems with uh, dealing with CRT. In CRT, we have to give to push more anti, more dosing, especially of antibiotic and so on. Not the full dose for, as normal patient, but uh, equal uh, nearly about seventy percent of the routine uh, dose. Uh, for example, here, if you use one comycin here in uh, some in one patient, one gram BID, you will use here 500 QD or BID. And also, siftazidine, if instead of the six gram per day, you can use one gram BID. Uh, and maybe um, uh, instead of uh, four gram per day, you can use 500 BID or BID. You have to increase the that as opposed to some percent in using, during using CRT. Uh, I will shift to other points which I am planning to 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 
if not about it, the arterial wave and its importance and the, as really arterial line as most of us know it is very important and mandatory and using it especially in patient operator except in the hemodynamic uh, uh, low hemodynamic parameters and we use uh, these are the dorsal speeders or uh, so the, the radial artery or dorsal speeders artery or femoral artery break here we can use the axillary but we prefer always radial artery because other arteries except in some complications so this is a brave arterial cannula a pressure line and then transducer but your but your transducer at the phlebostatic point which is force Intercostal space, mid axillary line, force intercostal space, and the mid axillary line, meaning at the level of the right atrium. And don't forget your flushing or pressure bag, which are blood pressure in about 300 millimeters per mercury by the stomach monitor cuff. And don't forget your solution here to be hibernized, and this will pass to avoid clotting of your line. This is a pressure line, you have is specified for arterial line, not with high compliance, not with low compliance. Arterial wave very important to uh, give you more more knowledge inside you and for interpreting your patient. If your patient hypovolemic, you will see when, uh, this wave will be accepting some variability, uh, wave variability or pressure wave variability, high to some extent, low and so on. Uh, this is the systolic area, the systolic area is the systolic pressure. If you hide about the contractility, if you, this is a wide wave, it may be low cardiac or what, if it is narrow, maybe high cardiac or what. The upstroke of the uh, systolic wave give you idea about the contractility of your cardiac muscle and so on. The acrotic notch, even the acrotic notch and its position will give you idea about uh, some situation. Uh, for uh, and it is used commonly as you know in pulse contour analysis and for uh, giving you the cardiac or both stroke, just stroke cannulations of arterial, radial artery and central venous cluster. You can get very, very uh, indices like volume indices and the pressure indices of your heart, systemic vascular resistance, pulmonary vascular resistance, as the Lung water, uh, extra vascular water, give me, give you several ideas, and so this is the value of the arterial line and the arterial wave, and this is the equation used inside the uh, apparatus for uh, checking the peak or pulse or analysis. Uh, the pulse wave variation, as I said, this is a normal wave. This is a reduced gradient in and reduced pulse pressure in and is aortic. Stenosis in these patients, uh, except in aortic recurge, and so the, there is increased pulse pressure and by uh, by different uh, waveform here. If we see here the steep downstroke, kind of this meaning below systemic vascular resistance. If it is slow and sloping, it meaning the high uh, systemic vascular resistance. The high diacrotic notch meaning the high systemic vascular, and so you can. From your when you accustom yourself to look at the screen and so the arterial wave, I think you will gain many, many benefits from your screen and from your input. Really, scientists for recent technology, not now we can assess our patient in many, many ways, really. And uh, we have many, many options for diagnosis. So this is the pulses alternance in the case of. Uh, Cardiac tamponade and you see during the stall, all the pressures in the beautiful eyes, rise, but the one which pressure will happen to the right side and so on. We will see pulse alternance in the case and this fusion around the left ventricle. And so the pulse wave helped me in detection and the diagnosis of the square test after you insert your arterial line. Don't forget the square, square test assess how fast the system vibrates in response to. A pressure uh, segment. You just squeezing, just squeezing this bag with, and opening the transducer valve. You push some fluid with high pressure, which is 300 millimeter mercury, and so it will give you the uh, uh, the uh, idea about the compliance of this response. And so this is a normal response. Yeah, after the flash test, you will see here, rises sharply and then plateau and then drops. 
after that, this flash is after flushing after opening this valve and subjecting the arterial line to high pressure in this valve, which is 300 millimeter mercury. And you will find there just one or two oscillations. If it is more oscillations, you will see here too much oscillations. This means this patient is under damping and will give you false result, false reading, and then the reverse is under damping and so on. Uh, we see here this is a normal optimal damping, and here as the positions and the position of the transducer, as I said, is also in the case along the mid axillary line. This patient exempting uh, uh, false reading because of over damping, no oscillations. So it's over damping. And you will see the strict blood pressure will be low if the patient is over damping. And the diastolic will be high. And the mean pressure will be the same. Mean pressure will be the same. But the stolic will be low, the stolic will be high. The reverse in under damping, under damping, you will see after flash test many, many oscillations here. And so here the systolic will be high, the systolic will be low, the mean arterial pressure is And so take care, uh, you have to make the flash test to be sure your reading will be accurate and guide you to correct the management of your patient. I say <coughs> thank you and <coughs> good luck for all our So um, thank you very much, uh, Professor Ansari, for this uh, excellent uh, presentations. Um, uh, yes, Dr. Mahdi, you want to say something? Um, uh, really, I am so proud that we have um, exclusively uh, Prof. Ansari, and you know his iconic figure in intensive care medicine in Egypt and the Middle East and all over the world that Thank he you. exclusively to the MEGA online course and uh, giving us uh, this excellent presentation. And uh, uh, he promised us uh, every, every Sunday, he will give us a very nice lecture. I'm sure he has a very good library and wherever he puts his hand, he will develop another lecture for us. So next Sunday, we will have an excellent talk from Professor Ansari and he's still tuned with us and uh, another lecture coming here for uh, uh, Dr. Adil. I leave uh, Dr. Mona Mubarak, and thank you, Dr. Ansari, on behalf of everybody. Uh, thank you, Dr. Adil. Thank you, Dr. Mona. Thanks for everyone. Okay. Thank you. So um, uh, I just have one more question for Dr. Ansari before we leave. We have actually a number of questions. You can find them on the Q&A panel, uh, but we'll just take one of them because of that time. Uh, can you please uh, tell us what is more accurate during the CRRT for monitoring coagulation? Is it the INR or the PT? This is one of the questions. Both, really both, INR and the BTT. Okay, perfect. BTT, BTT and INR. BTT and INR. Because okay. Because give you an idea about the coagulability observation. Okay, and do you think the nutrition the proper nutrition, if it's given in a proper way and manner, does it decrease the mortality and morbidity for patients? Decrease, decrease the mortality? Morbid, yeah, morbidity and mortality for patients. Of course, of course, we, we, of course, one of the indication of CRT is a good nutritional for the patient. We are supporting the patient with nutrition, optimum nutrition. Perfect, we use it some. We use it sometimes for nutritional support. Excellent. Thank you so much, Professor Ansari. It was an honor and pleasure to have you tonight. Thank you, Dr. Amona. Thank you. Thank you. You're very welcome. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I think we are now running out of time. Uh, there are so many uh, questions in the panel, and there is a uh, huge interest from all audience about the arrhythmia. Uh, myself, personally, I find arrhythmia one of the most difficult and challenging uh, you know, things to treat and to read the ECG. So thank you so much for this excellent presentation. I would like to thank uh, all the uh, speakers for today. Uh, Dr. Samir Al-Ansari, thank you so much. Uh, thank you, thank you for thank you much. Bro. Dr. Tahlul, thank you so much. Your presentation was more than excellent. We really enjoyed the polytrauma patient and I think you will have a homework for tonight. Multiple questions in the, in the Q&A and please answer these questions if possible. And Dr. Um, Adil Hussein, thank you so much. 
Dr. Saad Mahdi, uh, many you. thanks for your effort. Thank and you. our audience, thank you so much for attendance today. Thank it you. was great thank attendance. You. We hope to see you again yeah. in the next session in our online anesthesia mega course and have a very thank good you. night for all of you. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you.